Hi everyone, Mrs. Basega here, and today we're working on the Unit 10 Review Packet. To start off, we're calculating the wavelength of a microwave. Now, all electromagnetic waves travel at the speed of light. That's 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. That's going to be put in for V, the speed. So if I want to calculate the frequency and I know the speed, I would use V equals lambda F. Or in this case, that's 3 times 10 to the 8th equals lambda, that's what I'm trying to calculate, times 3 times 10 to the 9th. Now, microwaves have a really high frequency. So when I divide these out, it'll have a really small wavelength. In the numerator, I have 3 times 10 to the 8th. In the denominator, I have 3 times 10 to the 9th. And that gives me a wavelength of 0 0.1 meters. Be sure that you're using some sort of calculator that allows you to put parentheses so that you don't change the order of operations inadvertently and get the incorrect answer. So I had the wavelength is C, 0 0.1 meters. This one's just a vocab question. The type of reflection in which the light is scattered into many directions is known as diffuse reflection, as opposed to specular. Refraction and regular are not modes of reflection. Speaking of reflection, in number three, a light ray strikes a flat mirror at an angle of 14 degrees from the normal. The law of reflection says the incident angle is equal to the reflected angle, but only if you measure those angles from the normal line. So it's not A from the mirror surface, so this is option A here. We want B from the normal line or actually choice D, 14 degrees from normal, not the mirror surface. When the reflection of an object is seen in a flat mirror, the distance from the mirror to the image doesn't depend on the color of light, but it depends on the distance of the object to the mirror, B. Now, if you're wondering where that comes from, I want you to think about a flat mirror for a second. With a flat mirror, m equals 1, but also m is equal to negative si over so. If m equals 1, that means that si is equal to so, or at least their magnitudes are. Changing the object distance changes the image distance. Because m equals 1, these quantities are equal to each other. So I had b. Similarly, if you stood three meters in front of a flat mirror, then I'd have SI equals SO. There's a negative on the SI because remember, a flat mirror does virtual images, so SI is negative. So my mirror image would be three meters behind the surface of the mirror. That's B. Then let's switch over to refraction. Refraction occurs when light changes medium. So it's going from one speed to another speed. Light is refracted as a result of the changes in the speed of light. So I put velocity, D, when it goes from one medium to another. Now the wording for this one is tricky because angle and wavelength do change, but angle and wavelength change because velocity changes. So the change in velocity is the refraction and it causes the change in angle and wavelength. Actually, frequency doesn't change because if you imagine that the source of light is some sort of like laser or something like that, the source's frequency remains unchanged. So even if it speeds up, the frequency stays the same. So we don't have a change in frequency. For number seven, when a light ray moves from air into glass at an angle, its path bends toward the normal in glass. A. Well, let's draw this out for a sec. When light goes from air with an index of refraction of one into glass, my angle for my refracted angle should be slimmer because this is going from a fast material air into a slower medium, glass. The 
faster material has the fatter angle. So this should have a slimmer angle for your refracted ray. It bends it towards the normal line. If the light was going to go along the path of my pen here, it's now rotating towards the normal line, A. Well, let's say we do the opposite. What if I go from slow to fast? Then it bends away from the normal line. It bends away from the normal line because think you're going from a slow material into fast. So it should have a slim angle in diamond and a fatter angle in water. I can tell it's going from slow to fast because the index is higher. So it must be going slower in the diamond and faster in the water because the water's index is lower. Number nine, dispersion occurs because light is refracting differently for different wavelengths. So it's not C or D that are asking about reflection. Light with a higher frequency refracts less than light with a lower frequency. And we can prove this because rainbows. Do you ever notice how red is on the outside of a rainbow and blue or violet is on the inside of a rainbow? Violet has a higher frequency, but it bends less away from its trajectory. So its change in angle is smaller. Violet or blue bends less than red. So I said that if the frequency is higher, it refracts less. Red moves much farther out from its original path, which is why red is on the outside of a rainbow. Number 10, a material of an unknown index of refraction is submerged in water and becomes invisible. That means its index of refraction matches. So 10 is C, equal indices of refraction. Make it hard to see the edges of transparent objects. Like with Orbeez, if I have water plus Orbeez, both have an index of 1.33. And that makes it really hard to see the edges. For number 11, when light passes through a narrow slit, this is diffraction. The passing through a narrow slit would be like when light goes through an opening, light or any wave goes through an opening, and makes these circular wave spreads, spreading out in all directions. That's diffraction. Whereas if I have constructive and destructive interference, this D is D. The bright spots are with our constructive interference. Our dim spots are with destructive interference. For number 13, a converging lens can make multiple types of images. Remember, a converging lens has a positive focal length and is convex in shape. And let's think of the images it can make. It can make a magnifying glass. It can make a projector, and it can make it work like the eye. The magnifying glass would have a virtual, upright, larger image. A projector would have real, inverted, larger image. And finally, the eye does real, inverted, and smaller image smaller because imagine the upside down person that's showing up on the back of your retina is smaller than the original object that reflected the light into your eye. So now let's cross them out. Virtual upright larger, check, that's a magnifying glass. Real inverted smaller, yeah, that's your eye. Real inverted larger, yes, that's a projector, that leaves D. So probably the easier way to cross this out would be to notice that real images are always inverted. So D is not a possible image that can be created with any device, let alone a converging lens. 
concave lenses cause parallel rays of light to diverge. Concave lenses bend in on both sides. Think of a cave. And they cause light to diverge away from a focal point. Concave lenses are diverging. Whereas convex lenses are converging. They cause parallel rays of light to get refracted down towards focal points. For 16, how is the focal length and the radius of curvature related? Remember, the radius of curvature is the size of a circle created by the overlap of the two sides of your lens. So if you had a convex lens that looks something like this, like this overlap, the center of curvature would be the center of the circle, and the focal length would be half of that radius. So imagine the radius is being formed by going out from the center of the circle, and the focal length is half of that. They are related to each other. They're not two names for the same thing, but the center of curvature, maybe we would say the radius of curvature is twice as big as the focal length, 16D. Equation to have in the back of your head for that is radius is twice the focal length. 17 I like because you can draw this if you get stuck. You don't have to memorize this, you could draw this out. If I have a candle that's placed really near to this type of lens, this causes rays to converge towards the focal point because this is a converging lens. It's convex in shape. I'm drawing my ray of light so that it bends when it gets to the vertical axis. It should go straight through the vertex. Ray one and ray two don't seem to be meeting up with each other in real life. So this must be a virtual image. That cancels out A, B, and C. Now, my eye sees these two rays of light and thinks to itself, brain, that doesn't make sense that those two rays are diverging. They should have come from the same place. And it imagines that they came from back here. Where your brain thinks those two rays intersect is the top of my candle. But the base of the candle is firmly planted on the principal axis. So now I see a virtual upright larger image, larger because M is greater than one, All right? So now let us do these out. For number 18, imagine a parallel ray going in towards that center of your lens, towards the vertical axis, converges towards the focal length. Another ray goes right straight through the vertex. The top of my candle is where those rays intersect, and the bottom of the candle is on the principal axis. Remember, to get the points for drawing your ray diagram, you need to draw your rays and also draw the image formed by your rays. If you were doing this not live on video, I would expect that you use the straight line tool in order to draw this properly. I'm only not using it because I'm trying to do this quickly. So this image is real. I can tell because rays one and two literally cross each other right here. So that crosses out B and E. I see that this candle is smaller than the original. So this must mean M less than one. So 18 is A. Now let's look at 19. An object is placed in front of a converging lens at a distance of 1.5 F. You could go draw out a ray diagram and sketch that for yourself, but I'm gonna show you a different way. Let's say I did the lens maker's equation. 1 over F is 1 over SI plus 1 over SO. Your physics teacher may have used DI and DL. They work the same way. It says my object is placed at 1.5 F. That means SO equals 1.5 F. I can just substitute this now and solve for SI. That's 1 over F is 1 over SI. That's what I'm looking for plus one over 1.5 F. And let's, uh, let's subtract and then least common denominator this. So that's one F minus one divided by 1.5 F 
equals 1 over SI. A nice common denominator to use here would be 1.5F. Let's make life easy. 1.5 minus 1 is 0 0.5 over 1.5F equals 1 over SI. So notice here that SI, when I cross multiply and solve this out, SI is going to be 1.5F divided by 0 0.5 or 3F. Things I know from this. I know that SI is positive now. So that means it is a real image. SI being positive means a real image. Mm -hmm. Next, let's take SI to solve for M. M is negative SI over SO. Negative SI would be negative 3F. SO is 1.5F. The Fs cancel out, so M is equal to negative 2. This tells me it's larger and inverted. That's kind of what I expected, though, because negative for M means inverted, and all real images are inverted. And I know it's larger because SO is smaller than SI. That's C. Other option, if you don't want to go do all this algebra, draw yourself out a ray diagram or memorize the images that are formed. Up to you. I'm just giving you options. Number 20, the lens in a human eye is convex. You can literally feel the cornea part of your lens, right? It's convex and therefore the image is inverted. Because convex rays cause the light to go towards the focal point that's in the center of the eye, those rays cross each other and an image of a person would show up as inverted. The light from their head is on the bottom, the light from their feet is on the top, and on the back of their eye, that image is inverted. The additive primary colors of light are red, green, and blue to match up with the cones cells that live in your eye, that are in your eye. Red, green, and blue, that means yellow is not one of those primary colors, even if your elementary school art teacher told you otherwise. We just serve different purposes here. Now for some short answer. For 22A, the different sections of the electromagnetic spectrum have different wavelengths and frequencies from each other. I'll write that answer out in more detail later. You should definitely know the bands of the electromagnetic spectrum from low energy to high energy. So that would be radio, microwave, infrared, visible, ultraviolet, x-ray, and gamma. Everything above visible is ionizing radiation. That's energy enough to knock an electron off of a DNA, could cause mutations, bad news bears. Visible light, you should also know, is made up of different colors, Roy G. Biv. And just like the rest of the electromagnetic spectrum, the only thing that's different about violet light than red light is its wavelength and frequency. So which bands have the highest frequency is gamma. That's because as frequency increases, energy increases in a direct relationship. So label the ends of the spectrum as low frequency and high frequency is to help you remember that energy and frequency are directly proportional. But since light is a wave, frequency and wavelength were inversely proportional. You saw this when we talked about sound too. A high pitched sound had a shorter wavelength than a low pitched sound. So I would have long wavelengths by radio. Radio waves could be the size of a central park or a city block or a mountain. Whereas gamma rays have wavelengths that are very, very short, smaller than an atom, though larger than a nucleus. 
for types of reflection. Diffuse reflection is what occurs with a really bumpy surface. Examples of this might be this piece of paper. When white light is incident on this paper, it randomly scatters off its red and green and blue in all different directions. Anyone around the room would see a combination of red, green, and blue light hit their eye, and their brain would think to himself, hey brain, that color is white. However, specular reflection is smooth. It has really nice normal lines that are going perpendicular to the surface. Both obey the law of reflection, but the bumpy surfaces have normal lines that are randomly all over here. Examples of specular reflection would be things like mirrors, surfaces of lakes or puddles, anything that is molecularly smooth. For number 24, a nearsighted person has a lens that causes light to focus too sharply. I want this to focus with my image on the retina. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna use a diverging lens, a concave diverging lens, and the point of that lens is to take these rays and splay them a little bit farther apart. If these rays started just a little bit farther apart than they did before, then when my, le then when my eye overcompensates to focus the light, it still bends it inwards at the same angle. So let's draw that. But now, when it's bent in at the same angle, it meets up on the back of the retina and forms a clear image. If my eye was the opposite, too short, and the focus needed to be stronger, I would use a converging lens to shorten up that focal length. For number 25, in the color vision model, our eyes can see real yellow photons, even though we have only cones to see red, green, and blue. Let's say I had a wavelength of yellow light that goes and hits my eye. The wavelength yellow occurs between red and green. When real yellow light with an actual wavelength hits my eye, that stimulates both red and green cones approximately equally. When my brain sees that equally stimulated reaction, it thinks to itself that that color is yellow. So a TV or a cell phone or a computer screen can use this to its advantage. Instead of needing my TV screen to have a million different pixels to produce a million different colors, what if we just used red, green, and blue to produce millions of correct colors? The millions of different colors come from different combinations of the three colors of light. The red, green, and blue in different proportions gives us millions of possibilities of color combinations. For number 27, a magenta ball is an object. So usually I draw this down here. Magenta is gonna absorb green light. Now let's say we're near a star that puts out just, oh, sorry, ooh. Uh, we need a color of light. Let's assume this is white light to start. There we go. We've got white light, magenta ball, and yellow sunglasses is the filter. The yellow sunglass filter absorbs blue light. So now let's do some subtraction. The white light from the sun puts out red, green, and blue. Magenta takes the green out, so only red and blue make it past this gauntlet. but yellow subtracts out the blue and only red makes it through. So the apparent color for number 27 is red. Same idea for number 28. Let's say I have white light that's made up of red, green, and blue, and it hits a cyan ball. Cyan is across from red in the color wheel so cyan absorbs red. That allows green and blue 
to make it through this gauntlet. Then it gets to a pair of green sunglasses. The primary colors of light actually take out both of the other colors. So green could take out red or blue. When the green light gets to it, it will loud through. Green likes green, green makes it through. But the blue light gets to the green filter and stops. The blue light is absorbed by the green filter and that's actually gonna cause the green filter to warm up with the energy from that blue light. Just like the energy from the red photons caused the cyan object to warm up. That energy has to go somewhere. Energy still conserved. All right, we've got more. What color does a yellow shirt appear? So yellow is my shirt. That's an object under a cyan light. No filter this time. A cyan light is made up of blue and green. Yellow is a cross from blue on the color wheel. So yellow absorbs out the blue and that leaves the green. All right, problem time. We're trying to calculate the wavelength of a radio wave. I know I'm gonna use the wavelength equation, the wave equation. All electromagnetic waves travel at a speed of three times 10 to the eighth meters per second in a vacuum. And it's safe to assume that this is a vacuum in this problem. I'm trying to solve for lambda. And I know the frequency is 92.5 megahertz. Mega is 10 to the sixth. So just in case you forgot when you're doing conversion factors, Let's say I've got 92.5 megahertz. I want to replace this M with its metric power of 10. So the 92.5 remains unchanged, but I want to replace M by 10 to the sixth hertz. And feel free to just leave it like that because now I'm going to divide on both sides. And when I divide on both sides, that's lambda, equals three times 10 to the eighth over 92.5 times 10 to the sixth. Make sure to use parentheses in your calculator or in Desmos, whichever. And this gives me something on the order of 3.24 meters. That makes sense because microwaves have a wavelength in the centimeter range, but radio waves have a wavelength in the meter or much bigger range. Next, what is the frequency of this light in air? So I'm still using the V is equal to lambda F equation. The speed of light, any light, is three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. The wavelength of 7.2 nanometers is 7.2 times 10 to the negative ninth meters. And solve for F. Divide on both sides, that is 7.2 times 10 to the negative ninth. And that leaves frequency is actually a really, really big number. 4.2 times 10 to the 16th hertz. If you forgot to put in the parentheses, you'd get a much smaller number. But that's not correct because we need to make sure to do order of operations correctly. All right, next we're going to use our diffraction Young's double slit experiment to figure out the thickness of a wire. I can see that the wavelength is 640 nanometers. So that's 640 times 10 to the negative ninth meters. Please convert everything to meters for me. Why? That's the distance between adjacent bright spots. That's three centimeters. Convert that to meters. So that's 0 0.03 meters. L is 0.5, so now let us solve for D. You get one point for writing the equation for Young's double slit experiment. That's Y equals M lambda L over D. Next, let's substitute. Y is 0 0.03. Since we want adjacent bright spots, M is gonna be equal to one. 
and miss the order number, and if you're talking adjacent bright spots, I miss just one. Wavelength is 640 times 10 to the negative 9. L is 0 0.5, and I'm solving for D. So notice, how is it going to get D on its own is I'm going to multiply D to the left and divide by 0 0.03. D is equal to 640 times 10 to the negative 9th times 0.5 over 0 0.03. This means D, the diameter or the thickness of this wire, would be 1.07 times 10 to the negative 5th meters. And think about how useful this tool is, right? So that means instead of trying to measure the thickness of this wire by getting a really small thing that can measure down to micrometer size, well, I could just measure bright spots that are three centimeters apart. And I can easily see three centimeters apart with my eyes without any special tools. If a green laser was used instead of red, that means the bright spots would be closer together. That's because as wavelength increases, the spreading increases. Y is larger because lambda is larger. Those are directly proportional. Since red has the larger wavelength, that means the red dots would be farther apart than the green dots. In fact, if you put in white light, you'd get red in the center you'd get green in the center and red farther out because red has the larger wavelength so it will have the wider spacing between where red constructively interferes. If it was an even thinner wire, then let's check this out. Y is equal to m lambda L over D. That means Y and D are inversely related. A thinner wire so D decreases, would make the bright spots farther apart. The inverse relationship means that as D is smaller, Y is larger. That would spread the spots farther apart from each other. For number 33, we're doing some calculations. And to be fair, there's a few different equations that have speed of light in them. I could use my speed equation I could use V equals lambda F, my wave equation, or I can use N is equal to C, that's my speed of light in a vacuum, over V, the speed of light in a material. I don't know distance and time or wavelength and frequency, so I would get a point for writing down this equation. It shows me, the physics teacher, that you can select the correct equations to meet the needs of your problem. I'm solving for V material so I'm going to use the index of refraction for an emerald. I would put in n is equal to 1.57. The speed of light in a vacuum is still 3 times 10 to the 8th. It's always that. And solve for V material. Cross multiplying here, that means V material is equal to 3 times 10 to the 8th over 1.57. And if you've done this problem correctly when you get to the end of it, you should still get a really big number. I'm getting 1.91 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. The density of the emerald slows down the light. It's always gonna be slower than the speed of light in a vacuum. So that's true, that's good. But I shouldn't be getting like incredibly slow. I shouldn't be getting 1.9 meters per second. I should still be getting a very fast speed. Next, let's go find the index of refraction for B. Index of refraction is 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second divided by the speed of light in a material. So I would get a point for writing this equation down. Easy, free point. Write this equation down before you go substitute things in so I know you've selected the correct equation and aren't just randomly trying to divide or multiply without thinking. The speed of light in the material is 2.29 times 10 to the 8th. 
And hey, just to make your life easy, the 10 to the 8ths cancel. Don't even bother plugging it into your calculator like that. 3 divided by 2.29 is something like 1.3. And to double check, it's actually 1.31. And to double check, that number should be somewhere between 1 and like 2.4. So I know that's a reasonable number. In the context of this problem, it's asking like, which material is this most likely to be? I would think this is ice. The index that's most close to 1.31 is ice. Ice's index is 1.309, so that's close enough. If we look at our chart, light travels fastest through a vacuum. You can tell because index and speed are inversely related. Notice that speed of light in a material is in the denominator in this equation. So the larger the index, the slower the speed. So diamond with the largest index has the slowest speed and the opposite, vacuum, the smallest index fastest speed. 33D. As light travels from water into air, it's going from a slow medium, because larger index, slower medium, into air, smaller index, faster medium. The index of refraction decreased. Uh, it just went from 1.3 to 1, smaller. The speed of light increases. It just went from slow to fast. The wavelength of light also increases. Because think like if the speed goes up, the wavelength goes up. But the frequency stays the same because it came from the same source. Now, we can sketch this out if it will help for, for D. Let's say that light is going from slow to fast. It makes a slim angle in the original material, water, and a fatter angle in the faster material, air. So my angle of refraction should increase because the speed is increasing. Faster material, fatter angle increases. The light bends away from the normal line because notice that the light was going to go along this path where my pen is and now bends outward away from the normal line along its new path. So let's check it for this one. As it goes from air into glass, we're gonna draw our normal line perpendicular to the material here. This angle needs to get slimmer. So I'm gonna bend it towards the normal line it's going in a slower material, slimmer angle. Notice how much smaller the angle in glass is than it is in air. Next, let's do another normal line. It's going from glass into water, so now it's going to speed up again. And when it speeds up again, it's going to go away from the normal. Just be careful here. This angle should be still smaller than air because water is still slower than air. So I'm going to do something like this. It bent slightly away from the normal, but it's still smaller than the original angle in air. Calculating problems. All right, so when light travels, and it goes into a new material, we want to calculate the index of refraction. There's two possible equations here. Index is 3 times 10 to the 8th over the speed in a material. Or I can use Snell's law. Ni sine theta sub i is equal to Nr sine theta sub r. It's going from air. That's an index of 1, and you should know this. Air's angle is 45 degrees. 
We don't know the unknown material, so I'm going to leave that NR and put a little circle around it so I know to solve for it in a second. And in this unknown material is 30 degrees. In the slower material, it should have a slimmer angle. So check, at least that makes sense. Now in your calculator, someone was asking like, how do I put sine into my calculator? Easy peasy. Hit the sine button right here. If you want, make sure your calculator is in degrees. So hit mode. See the word degree is highlighted. That's a good sign. So I'm hitting sine 45, enter. Sine 45 is 0 0.707. Still solving for an R, sine 30. Is 0 0.5. But now I can just solve this. I'm going to divide 0 0.5 to both sides. NR is 0 0.707 divided by 0 0.5. So NR is 1.414. At the end of a problem, I want to make sure that this makes sense. The index of refraction is a number between 1 and about 2.4. So I think we've done this right. Now I can go back and use it to calculate the speed of light. I couldn't do that before because I didn't know the speed or index, so that didn't help. But now I do. Knowing that the index is 1.14, that's n is equal to 3 times 10 to the 8th over v, substitute in my newly found index and solve for v. I'm going to cross multiply so that v is equal to 3 times 10 to the 8th over 1.14. This gives me 2.12 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. And just to double check here, this is a fast speed. It's still going really quick, but it's less than the speed of light in a vacuum. So I know I've done that okay. Finally, down to the wavelength and frequency of light. I know that its original wavelength is 500 nanometers. So in air, my wavelength is 500 nanometers. And I know the speed of light in air. It's functionally the same speed of light in a vacuum. Because in air, the particles are so few and far between, I can assume that the index I can assume that the speed of light in air is about 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. The wavelength is 500 nanometers in air, so that's 500 times 10 to the negative 9. And solve for F. Divide by 500 times 10 to the negative 9 and bring it to the other side. The frequency should be very large. The frequencies of visible light are Quite a lot. This gives me 6 times 10 to the 14th hertz. Now I do want to point this out here. If we look in air then, it has a wavelength of 500 times 10 to the negative 9th meters and a frequency of 6 times 10 to the 14th hertz. Now when this goes from air into my unknown material, it's going to slow down. That decreases the wavelength but keeps the frequency the same. So in my unknown material, take that frequency you just found and you're going to use it again. But a thing to be careful about in the unknown material, the speed is not 3 times 10 to the 8th. It's 2.12 times 10 to the 8th. I'm trying to find wavelength now, and I know the frequency is the same. So it's still 6 times 10 to the 14th hertz for the frequency. Dividing by both sides, that means my wavelength 
is 2.12 times 10 to the 8th over 6 times 10 to the 14th hertz. This gives me a wavelength of 3.53 times 10 to the negative 7th. But so, hey, just so we have it all in the same unit of measure then, my wavelength in my unknown material actually gets smaller. It goes to 353 nanometers. If I change the order of uh, power of 10 to make them easily comparable, notice that in the faster material, you have the larger wavelength with the same frequency. In the slower material, you have a slower speed with a shorter wavelength in the same frequency. Now let's calculate for number 36. An object is placed along the principal axis of a thin diverging lens with a focal length of negative 15. Fun fact, that means I have a concave diverging lens and remember, this always makes a virtual upright smaller image. Let's see that we get those back at the end. Things I know, distance from the object to the lens is 10 centimeters. So let's make it a candle and it's 10 centimeters from the lens. So SO is equal to 10, F is equal to negative 15. Let's do some math. Taking the lens maker's equation, that's 1 over f plus 1 over si plus 1 over so. Write that equation down before you substitute anything in, because that's how I know that you know how to select an equation. That's 1 over negative 15 equals 1 over si, that's what I'm trying to solve for, plus 1 over 10. I'm going to subtract my 1 tenth to the other side. equal to 1 over si. And probably the fastest way to do this one is to do a least common denominator. So this is negative 2 thirtieths minus 3 thirtieths is equal to 1 over si. That's negative 5 thirtieths is equal to 1 over si, such that si is equal to negative 6. Hey, fun fact, we've just proved a thing. The negative six here indicates that this image is virtual. Now let's see if we can get the, the smaller and upright business. M is negative SI over SO, but SI is already negative six. That's a double negative. So negative negative six over SO was 10, my negatives cancel out, and 6 tenths is 0 0.6. The positive in this indicates that it's upright, and the fact that the magnitude of m is smaller than 1 indicates that the height of the image is smaller than the height of the object. Let's try another one, and I'll show you a different way to solve the lens maker's equation. 37a. We're trying to find a focal length. We know SO is 20. We see my image, there's a real image, forms at 30 centimeters from the lens. So that's 30 is SI. And since 30 was given as positive and real, I know this is real and I know SI is a positive number. Let's solve for one over F. So I get a point for writing down the original equation with no substitutions in it. 1 over f is 1 over 20 plus 1 over 30. If you don't want to least common denominator this, you could at least plug it into your calculator just like that. This would be 1 20th plus 1 30th. This gives me 0 0.083. But then, if I want to solve for f, I need to cross multiply. So if 1 over f is equal to 0 0.083, then f must be the inverse of that. f would be equal to 1 over 0 0.83.
and that is 12. That makes sense to me because we said it's a converging lens, and a converging lens has a positive focal length, no matter what type of image it's making. Converging lenses are convex, and convex has a positive focal length. So that's good. So magnification. M is equal to negative SI over SO. SI was 30, so negative 30. SO is 20. Negative 30 over 20 is negative 1.5. We already knew it was real. Now we know that it's inverted because the negative sign means it's inverted. And the fact that the magnitude of M is larger than one means that's a larger image than object. For number 38, we want to draw the image and classify the image. So I do, when you're doing this on a computer, want you to draw this using the straight line tool. Don't draw this by hand and make a mess. First, a ray leaves the top of the object going parallel in and diverges away from a focal point. So imagine the light's coming from this focal point and goes away. That's ray one. If this were a converging lens, it would go towards the focal point, but it doesn't. Ray 2 leaves the top of the object and goes straight through the vertex. And I can already see this image. Hey, Ray 1 and Ray 2 don't meet in real life. But our eyes over here see those rays of light diverging and assume that they must have come from the same place, back behind the lens. So the image formed has the top of the arrow being where my rays intersected, the bottom of the arrow is on the principal axis. So when I compare my object to my image, this is a smaller upright, and let's see, that is a virtual image because the rays don't actually intersect each other. All right, so we're gonna keep the same rules. Ray one goes parallel in and is going to converge towards the focal point. Ray two goes down towards the vertex, connecting the top of the object to the vertex, but bending straight through. This is virtual again, so it's automatically going to be upright. Those rays don't actually intersect, but your brain thinks they do. So if we draw these as dotted lines going backwards, we see the top of the arrow would be here. The bottom of the arrow is firmly planted on the principal axis. And when I compare my object to image, I now see that it's larger. This is a magnifying glass scenario. Same deal for this one. Draw that ray one parallel in, parallel to the principal axis. When that light hits the vertical axis of your lens, it's now gonna converge towards the focal point. Ray two starts at the top of your object and goes through the vertex. Bend straight through. Now that's probably gonna meet somewhere off the page. So let's say it meets right here. That makes that the top of the arrow. And now comparing my image to object, my image is larger. Those rays will actually intersect. I can probably just draw them right here and they intersect, right? Close enough. <laughs> Since those rays literally intersect each other, this is gonna be a real image and it's inverted from its original orientation. If I wanted to create an upright image that's magnified by a factor of three in order to look at an old photograph, I would use a converging lens, convex converging. What this would do is it makes an image like 38B. 
this image would be virtual larger and upright, which is what we really want from a magnifying glass. Unfortunately, a diverging lens only ever makes virtual upright and smaller, so I wouldn't want that. For 39B, let's do some math. You determine that you need to place the photograph 10 centimeters from the lens. So that's SO equals 10. In order to get an image three times the size. I know M is gonna be equal to three, but hey, hmm, <laughs> M is actually an absolute value here. We actually know from earlier that if I want the image to be larger, it's going to be virtual. So it's virtual. That means SI is going to be a negative number. So calculate SI. If the so we want to calculate SI knowing this information. So M is equal to negative SI over SO. If M is 3 and SO is 10, then SI will be equal to negative 30. And that makes sense because this negative sign here indicates that it is a virtual image. In order to get this focal length then, I'm gonna do lens maker's equation. That's one over SI plus one over SO and solve for F. One over SI is one over negative 30. SO is 10, and let's least common denominator this. This is 1 over F is equal to 1 over negative 30 plus 3 over 30. 3 minus 1 is 2. So if 1 over F is equal to 2 thirtieths, then F is equal to 15. I can see that I've done this right because 15 is positive and this focal length should always be positive. Finally, for number 40. On the human eye, the cornea looks like it's number eight. That's this bump on the top of the eye here that provides both refraction plus protection. The ciliary muscles are six. They open or they stretch and compress the lens, that's seven. This crystalline lens can adjust depending on what sort of focusing it needs to do. The fovea is spot three, right on the back of the eye here. That's where you have the highest concentration of cone photodetector. That's the center of your vision. So that's where you can see fine detail and you can see clearly in color. On the rest of the retina, you have your rod cells. So let's put in retina is number four. It's this film on the back of the eye here where all those photodetectors are, right? Number five is the sclera. That tough white tissue on the outside of the eye that you've seen when eyes are removed in horror movies. Now let's take a look at one. One is where we see all these nerves collecting and going up to the brain. One is the optic nerve. And right where the optic nerve meets the base of the retina here, that's your optic disc. Since all the nerves are collecting there, you don't have photoreceptors there. Light hits it, but since there's no photoreceptors, nothing is there to pick it up. So the optic disc is what's primarily responsible for you having blind spots, one in each eye. Now the iris and pupil are closely connected because they both do the same accommodation as each other. I had 10 being the iris. So the iris is this colored muscle in the eye right here. And it's gonna open and close the pupil to let in more light as needed. Thus the pupil is left as number nine. Number nine is pointed right at this black hole in your eye. And that hole allows light in, but it's really just a hole. 
The reason it looks black is because once light enters the pupil, it's absorbed by the photoreceptors in your retina. There's nothing left to reflect back out through the pupil so other people can see it. So it looks black because black is the color your brain thinks it sees when it has an absence of color. All right, everyone, best of luck on the last test of the year.